Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Leaders Credit Union. Zach, and welcome everybody to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Zach, before I introduce today's very, very, very special guest, what is something you discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? Uh, recently, I was in the outdoor portion of our Duck, Duck, Goose, Waterfowl, the Mississippi Flyway exhibit. And I did not realize we had a TV in there where you could listen to different kinds of duck call noises. Uh, I think there's about eight on there. You can press one and hear a different one. There's a whispering call, a feeding call, and several others. I didn't even know there was different calls. But Have you ever been duck hunting? Once. Did you not call when you went duck hunting? I did not. You just go, here, ducky, ducky. <laughs> I, I let the professionals do the well, Quotation professionals do the calling. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, we also have, we have a lot of duck calls in there um, that people can actually take a look at, but we don't have any that they can actually go. <laughs> that was a duck. That was a duck sound for those of you <laughs> listening. Um, so yeah, no, it is, it is really fun to watch uh, folks push the button and then watch the kids try to replicate the sound. We, we brainstormed ways we could actually have a duck call in there that people could use, but um, there was no way without spit going yeah, everywhere. Too germy. So, yeah, very, very germy. So, um, okay. So our guest today is Jeremy Powell. Full disclosure, Jeremy is a longtime member of Discovery Park of America. He's a friend of mine, and both his daughters are on the payroll here at Discovery Park working at the ticket counter. He's also the pastor of Crosswind Church here in Union City. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you. So good to be here. Okay, so full disclosure, we're not going to try to fake it. I forgot to push the record button. And so and so this first part um, is the second time we've done it. But as Jeremy pointed out, he preaches two sermons every Sunday. So um, thank you for being a good sport. Um, Jeremy was born with an audio, an autoimmune deficiency that rendered his body incapable of defeating bacterial and fungal infections. Take us back to the very beginning when your mom uh, took her baby home and realized something was goofy. Right. Yeah. So single mom, she was uh, 19 years old. We were living with my grandparents at the time. I started running a fever and uh, they called it a fever of unknown origin. They couldn't figure out why. I was running these fevers and uh, ended up at Vanderbilt Hospital, uh, the Children's Hospital uh, down in Nashville for about three months. Um, they finally discovered that there was an infection on my liver uh, when they biopsied it grew out a, a, a bacteria called serratia. And uh, just so happened, a very smart doctor named Peter Wright had just read an article about this uh, immune deficiency called chronic granulomatous disease. And uh, so they tested me for it, and it was it was positive. Um, very rare disease. Um, and so they they went to my mother and they said, uh, the life expectancy of your son is going to be about five years. Um, we don't expect him to live past that. And so here you have a, a a mom that at the time is about you know twenty years old, single, living with her parents has a newborn baby that's about 18 months old at this point in time. And, and she realizes, uh, Hey, his life is, is, is going to be cut short. Um, and so that's kind of how it all began. Now, So you're living with your grandparents. How long, uh, did you live with your parents and your grandparents as a child? Yeah. So I lived with my, we lived with my grandparents until I was about four. And then my mom met my father and, and they got married and, and then, uh, my dad adopted me. Uh, at that point in time. Well, he's a champion, isn't he? Because he you know, absolutely was, is. He's it, one of my heroes. He's it, he is. It, it was a it was a super big challenge to step into a role with, you know, a youngster that had potential uh, health problems, I'm guessing. Yep. One of my earliest memories of dad actually is I had had a, a an abscess in the chest in my chest cavity when I was about four. Uh, it was before he and mom were married, actually, and I can remember him coming to Vanderbilt uh, and visiting us there. 
uh, one of my one of my first memories of him is that. Is he still uh, living? Yeah, yeah, no, he's he lives up in Hopkinsville, and uh, and uh, yeah, he he in fact was instrumental in some of my recovery from the meningitis. He. He uh, uh, and his wife actually purchased the van that I, I used to get around in today. So fantastic. Um, so at, w- at what point as a little kid, uh, do you remember the awareness that you were perhaps different or you were dealing with something that maybe not everybody else was? Yeah, no, I, I, I never remember a time when I wasn't aware that I was I was different. My body had the scars of various surgeries that I'd had, um, uh, you know, like I, like I said, I, some of my earliest memories, I can remember being in the hospital very young, um, and, and going through those things. Um, and, uh, and so never did I, did I have any other sense of normalcy uh, other than being in and out of the hospital and having infections. It really wasn't until, uh, probably high school, maybe college, when, when, you know, when I started dating and, and thinking about marriage and settling down, you know, and having kids myself, you you know, you start thinking about, okay, I I need to make sure that I share with my fiance and I I had to share with Jody before we got married, you know, there will be a time that I have an incurable disease. There's going to be a time where I'm going to get an infection and it's going to take my life. Um, and so before you say I do at the altar, you know what you're signing into, uh, and, and, and what you're getting into. And before we start thinking about having kids, we've got to, we've got to think through all of this stuff because I've lived with it my entire life. You're, you're, you're coming in, you know, late in the game, so to speak. I'm already on borrowed time at this point. Now it's not, it, it's not, you know, to even back then it wasn't obviously obvious to somebody that you were dealing with an incurable disease um from the outside wrapper you appear completely like everybody else so you know it's probably hard to really even realize that what was it like for your mom to to wait for five and then hit six and then seven and then you know was she always fearful that right around the next corner was disaster i don't i don't i don't really know we've never really spoken about that i i do know that one of the things my mom instilled in me from a very early age was, hey, you know what? We're going to live life uh, the way we want to live it. And if you want to go try something, we'll let you try it. You want to play baseball? We'll let you play baseball. You want to go on that that field trip? We'll go on that field trip. And and we're not going to uh, to, to kind of walk on eggshells around this disease. Um, and so as a result, I was never – um, I was never scared of trying something or doing something like, oh, I might get sick if I do this. Um, in fact, I was maybe even a little bit on the the other side of it. Like, I dare you to make me sick. There's nothing that I can't overcome, you know, and I, I was just I, I had that mindset instilled in me from a very early age. I, I would go to the hospital and get, in, you know, put in the hospital with an infection that really was really dangerous, you know? And, and the question that I would ask is how quick can I get out of here? I got, I got to go back to school. I've got to, there's other things I've got to do. You know, we got to, got to get back to work. Um, one of the stories that I, I, I share, I had a fungal infection in my lungs one time and they put what's called a Broviac catheter in my chest, big long tube and they wrap it around. And I was playing baseball at the time. And my grandfather was uh, helping to coach the team. And I'd been out sick because I'd had this infection and I was back at baseball practice and the team had gotten in trouble and we were having to run laps around the field. And uh, the coach yells out, he was talking to my grandpa. He yells out, he's like, Powell, get over here. And so I ran over to him and and my grandpa was grinning and 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 he said, hey, show, show coach what's in your chest. And so I lift up my shirt and I've got this big, massive, you know, catheter in my chest and i've just been running laps with everybody else and coach's like are you okay do you need to sit down and stop and nah, i'm good you know i'll I'll let you know um that's just the mindset i've always had and that came from that came from my mom and my family we're just gonna go and do and be and um let the let the chips fall where they may so through the years did you sort of develop um a shell around yourself that you know you didn't want people to uh 
look at you with sympathy or, oh, you know, of course, uh, you know, when I, in elementary school and middle school, I can remember being very self-conscious, uh, that I had this disease. I, I, you know, I grew up in the eighties and so we had the, the AIDS pandemic going on at the time. And there was all this stigmatism that surrounded people that had a disease. And, and so, uh, gosh, I was scared that if somebody knew that I had this disease, that they would they would be different around me. And so I I definitely played that very close to the vest. It wasn't really until middle school and high school that I felt comfortable beginning to share that with some friends. Um, and uh, it really kind of kind of helped point me in a direction of what I wanted to do with my life. And, and, you know, probably I'm guess. I mean, when I first met you, it was a couple of years before I even knew, you know, that you had anything serious or life threatening, you know, because you, you look completely, you know, like the rest of us, you know, and we can't see through <laughs> your skin. Right. Right. Um, and so, you know, you probably, even when you told people, you know, unless they were very intimate with you and your family, they probably didn't even really comprehend what that was all about no the seriousness of it yeah i would agree with that so you started off uh thinking you might want to pursue a career in the healthcare field right that's correct yeah so um in about about 11 12 years old um i started going to the national institutes of health where they uh they made me a guinea pig basically i tested uh, all kinds of medicines and things like that and procedures for people with CGD, my disease. And um, when they first offered me the opportunity, I can remember mom sitting me down and going, hey, you know, that there's probably gonna be some things that are gonna be unpleasant. And, and and you know, is this something you really wanna go through? And I had a, a younger cousin uh, that had the same disease as me. He was 10 years younger than me. And I, I remember very clearly at that age going, you know what, if something I go through can help him, uh, or if something I go through can help another person along the way, um, then yeah, heck yeah, sign me up. I want to be a part of that. And so um, that led me to, to to just kind of this love of science. And I thought I can give a unique perspective to a child that's laying in a bed, uh, you know, because I have been through some of the things that they're going through. And I can tell them what it feels like and I can tell them what what they might experience and i can empathize with them in a way that that i had never had doctors and nurses that could empathize me with me in those ways and uh and so i began to pursue medicine went to college and did a, a degree in biology pre-med and then uh, ended up at vanderbilt uh doing uh, a phd in microbiology and immunology uh was there for about a year so and and Obviously, because you're a pastor now, somewhere along the way, God shifted your path. That's correct. Yeah. How'd that happened. Um, I, I was at Vanderbilt, and my plan was um, to go do my, my PhD in microbiology and immunology and teach and work in a laboratory while I went and did my, my MD. Because um, there are people that do PhD, MD together, and, and, and I think that they're crazy. Uh, they're like super smart and and I couldn't do both at the same time, but I was going to do one than the other. And about a year into my PhD work, um, I, I, I just was miserable. I, and, and I was, there were cool things going on in the lab. Like I still like to geek out about the things that I was doing in the lab at the time, working on RSV and, and, um, and, and classes were going okay. I mean, they weren't great, but they were okay. And, um, and 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 in the middle of all of that, I spent a lot of time in my apartment in Nashville praying and and you know just just think you know seeking what it was. And it was in the that process that that God led me to say, hey, you're going to help people uh, and you're gonna be able to empathize with people, but you're gonna do it in a different way than through medicine. Um and so then you, you gotta call your fiance, right? Who who thought she was gonna marry a doctor. And and now you go, hey, surprise, you, you know, bait and switch. And now I'm going to be a pastor. And um, and luckily, Jody uh, was actually not saddened by that, but but excited by that. She had always felt God leading her in that direction herself. And she never really understood what that meant. And 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 so now we had a direction together as a couple. Uh, and so I left Vanderbilt and we got married and moved off to Fort Worth, Texas to go to seminary. And and you and I have talked before, in fact, moments ago, about the fact that 
<laughs> about the fact that, uh, you know, I spent my high school years at Southwestern uh, where you and Jody were. Um, mm. And so, you know, I know the sort of the vibe there, Gambrel Street Baptist. Did you ever go to Gambrel Street Baptist Church? I did church? not. No, I did not make it to Gambrel Street. Where did you go to church when you were in Fort Worth? Uh, I, w- I went to Wedgwood Baptist at first, and and so that was the church. We actually started going to Wedgwood two years post the shooting that occurred there. Okay. Um, and then uh, I ended up, we ended up going there, and I served on staff there. Um, and then Wedgwood did a church revitalization project with another community church there called Meadowridge Community Baptist Church. And I went there a- as a part of the staff team that went to Wed to, to Meadowridge and and I served there uh before we moved back to Alabama. And then we've talked about we both know Dennis Swanberg, the yeah. comedian slash uh-huh. Uh, minister slash a whole lot of other things. And I said, we need to get him here to Northwest yeah. Tennessee. I, I see yeah. his schedule every once in a while on, on Facebook. So we'll, we'll work on that. Um, okay. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, so, I'll show up to that one. Where was your, where was your first, uh, where was your first church after post seminary? Where did you start ministering first? Uh, so I pastored uh, at a church in Alabama, first Baptist church of Hayden. Hayden is located about 30 miles north north of Birmingham. It was right next to Jody's hometown and near her family. Um, and I pastored there for seven years before moving to Northwest Tennessee. How did, uh, how, how did, uh, it come about that you landed here in our part of the, in God's country, as we say? Yeah, no, well, the, the, uh, the, the, the short answer is God orchestrated it. Um, the, the longer, a little bit longer answer is, uh, I, Jody and I had a combined bad day uh, is what it amounted to. I had, I had had a bad day at the office and I couldn't even tell you what had happened. And, you know, everybody has, you know, bad days and Jody is a school teacher and and the school she was at, she had had a bad day and, and we're both at the house and we're just, I mean, we're, we're just both lamenting about our day. And, and, uh, and I looked at Jody and I said, well, let's just, just find me a job. We'll just go somewhere else. Right. And so uh, in, in the next 24 hours, we probably sent out five resumes that, you know, and that's it. That's that's nothing. And and we went back to work the next day and things were better. And uh, Crosswind Church ended up contacting me. And um, uh, I was very honest with them from the very beginning. Hey, like I things are great here. Not not really interested in moving. And and, and man, they just kept calling and kept calling. And uh, I came to know these guys on the search team and. And uh, they were like, "We'll just come up and see the town, you know." And I came up and and saw the town, and and uh, one thing leads to another, and it was just a great fit for us and our family, and 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 we were happy to move up here. It's crazy how once you step into the stream, it just kind of takes over, and That's you, right. just, you just ride it out, and yeah. you end up where God intends for you to be. That's exactly right. No, we, I have a saying, I tell my daughters this all the time, pursue what you know is on God's heart and he'll get you where it is that he wants you to be. Yeah. Fantastic. So you, you, you come to this part of the country and you, how long were you pastoring before you had another, I don't know if you call it a flare up, but before you started getting sick again. Um, so I had been here about six years, not quite five and a half years or so when uh when my back started to hurt and uh it it started to hurt in january february of 2020 and that of course is when covid was beginning to rage in the country and so i contacted my doctors at vanderbilt let them know what was going on and they they said to me well we think it's really musculoskeletal we think maybe you pulled a muscle or you've got a disc or some bone degeneration from a previous infection um, you know, we, either way, we can't get you in to get an MRI anyway, where they're not seeing anything that's not critical at the hospital now because of COVID. So we're just going to treat it with, you know, take your Tylenol and your ibuprofen and all of that. And, uh, and we'll watch it for a little while. And, and, and things kind of progressively got a little worse. The pain didn't go away. And finally, uh, I believe it was May the 6th, May the 4th, May the 5th, the 6th, somewhere in that range. Uh, we we took a trip to to Nashville and they were going to to do an MRI and so my girls we all loaded up in the car and went we're going to make a, a day of it they went to Trader Joe's and 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 they dropped me off to get the MRI 
uh, we got back in the car and, and they, you know, Jody had gotten me some Chipotle. I was getting ready to munch into my tacos and the phone rang and it was Vanderbilt. And they said, you know, are you still in town? And we said, yeah, we are. And they said, well, you don't leave. You got to come back. We, we've got to admit you, you've got, you've got an infection that's all up and down your spine and into your brain. And, uh, and we've got to begin treating it immediately. We're not sure what it is. Uh, it's meningitis, but we don't know if it's bacterial or viral or fungal. So we, but, but we have to admit you right now. Um, and so we literally turned the car around and drove right back and Jody dropped me off. COVID really was, I I mean, it was a mess. Uh, Jody dropped me off on the side of the road. I had my backpack and I walked into the ER and they admitted, admitted me. That was, that was how it, it worked. Of all the times in history to have to be admitted to the hospital. Right. This is no worse time. Yeah. Uh, to, right. to have to be admitted. Um, you know, I mean, I remember even at church, you know, we were sitting far apart from each other. Uh, yeah. Everybody was, you know, masked up. Are you masked up? Are you not? Do you not wear your mask? You know, it was all this, all this stuff going on in our culture. And, you know, it feels a little like when we needed you most to bring some sensibility, right? you know, you're in some ways being taken out of the game. Yeah. In fact, so I was able to help navigate it at the church from, from, you know, from January to May. And, and, and so things were just kind of starting churches were like, we had taken a month off of church, you know, and, and churches were kind of just starting to go back and are we going to go back or are we not? And, um, and, and we had just started putting some of those things in place and all of a sudden I'm, I'm, I'm out. And so for about, 18 days or so I was in the hospital and, and all I'm doing is trying to get back, get back. Uh, and so I'm, I I don't know if you remember, I'm recording videos from my hospital bed and sending them out to the congregation. And I'm trying to do staff meeting, you know, from, from a hospital room. It was just, it was a crazy, crazy time. Yeah, no, I do. I do remember that. And, you know, there was so much other things going on as well. You know, you could have had COVID for half of what we remember. Did you ever get COVID while you were in the hospital? I, I've had COVID three times. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was funny. The, the first time I got it was on my second trip to Vanderbilt. And they were like, hey, you've got COVID. Are you having any symptoms? And my response was, I have fungal meningitis. I have all <laughs> kinds of symptoms. Like, like I don't know what's what's COVID and what's not. Like, um, and so, yeah, no, I praise God that didn't, that didn't make a, 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 a bit of difference to me. So now while you were in the hospital, things really went from bad to worse. And they said you had to have a serious operation. Yeah, we've got, we've got to operate right now. Um, and so, uh, and so they, they, they whisked me into surgery and went in and, and, and the infection had, had, was, had just spread everywhere up and down my spine. And they removed some of the lesions. But at that point, they said, we've got to get you back to the NIH because a bone marrow transplant is going to be your only hope of survival. Uh, and so um, what's going through your head and, and what's going through that? How, how much are they talking to you about how desperate the situation is? Um, it really wasn't until we got back to the NIH that it really, it really hit me. Um, I can remember we had a couple of our doctors come in, uh, doctors that I'd, some of them I'd been working with since I was 11, 12 years old. And I came in and they sat down and they said, here's, here's the reality of it. Um, and this is really when it hit me. Um, the medicines are not clearing the, the meningitis. They're not going to. Uh, we can't operate because it's so widespread. I mean, we, we can't just slice you from, from, you know, from head to toe. Um, and so your only chance of survival is for us to do this bone marrow transplant and then hope that your body with these new cells we're going to give you are going to kick in and kill the disease. And uh, I said, well, what are my chances of of even surviving the transplant. And that's when they said, we think you've got about a 25% chance of surviving the transplant. And if you survive the transplant at 25%, you're still going to deal with, is it going to fight the infection in your body? And when it hit me, as I said, I don't want to die in a hospital bed 
800 miles away from my kids. And he said, I can't promise you that. That was that. And when he said that, I, it was when it was real. And, and Jody and I looked at each other and the decision that we had was, was a very real decision. Go home and be with my family and, and die, which would be about nine months is what they said. Or stay here and, and let them do the bone marrow transplant and fight and still more than likely die. Um, those, those were our options. And, uh, and, and so we, we spent a lot of time praying and crying and I called a couple of mentors of mine and, 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 and ultimately we decided to stay and fight. Did you, um, Google, you know, like, no. did you, you know, try to figure out, have, have other people done this before? And yeah, did you the, do any research on your own? The, um, the only time I Googled something was when I first got diagnosed that first time they admitted me at Vanderbilt, I Googled fungal meningitis and it said people with immune deficiencies, which I had only survived these things about 18% of the time. And, uh, I called Jody that night cause you know, I, I couldn't have any guests or anything in my hospital room because of COVID. And I, I called Jody and <laughs> I told her, she was like, you ought not Google stuff anymore. And I was like, okay, that's fine. Um, but no, uh, other than that, we, you know, what I was going through was very unique. The, the, I mean, it's not like any, and it's been that way my entire life. There's not a textbook for what I go through. When I was diagnosed, my disease was literally called fatal chronic granulomas disease. Like, like people don't live to be my age with this disease. And so doctors have been telling me that for a few years now, like, hey, we really don't know what's going to happen. Um, so there's not a there's not a template for me to follow. So um, are there other is there anybody else out there with what you had who's, you know, survived like you have and thrived? And, you know, I'm not. Uh, yes. I mean, there are people out there that that have chronic granulomas disease. I have a cousin that does as well, but um, none that I'm aware of that have had you know, fungal meningitis and, and survived. I'm, I, there may be, uh, but I'm not aware of any. Um, my situation is, is definitely very rare, if not unique. So as you're going up before they put you under to take you back for surgery, what's going through your head? Um, you know, I had done so many surgeries, um, I, I don't know that I really, I, you know, I, I don't get scared or worked up about operations anymore. Maybe I should have. Um, but uh, but no, I can't really think that there was any kind of, OK, I'll see you when I wake up. Well, I, my philosophy has always been and I try to tell this to my parishioners, too, as a follower of Jesus, when when you go into an operation, there's only two ways you can wake up. And one way is groggy and with your family. And the other is with Jesus. And, and neither one of those is a bad situation. So, um, you know, you just approach it with that kind of mindset. And, and uh, you know, so far I've woken up groggy with my family every time. <laughs> so um, at what point when you, when you woke up, uh, this time, did you realize things weren't quite working the way they were when you started? Yeah. So at, at the NIH, when I went back for the bone marrow transplant, I, at that point had had, uh, two or three neck surgeries, um, and slowly was losing even more mobility. Um, uh, also the meningitis was wreaking havoc with my, with my mind. So, uh, there's a lot of, th I had hallucinations. Uh, I would see things that weren't there. I would lose the ability sometimes to even, uh, come up with the right word, uh, to, which for a guy that talks for a living is frustrating, right? You know, you, you in your mind, you know what you want to say and you can't, you can come up with every other word, but the word that you want to say it. Um, but but over the period of the transplant, uh, because I was so in and out of it and so, um, man, just so sick, um, you know, I spent weeks uh, and, and, and really, I guess, at, at one point, a couple months uh, just laying in bed. That was all I could do. So your muscles atrophy. Uh, but the pressure that was on my spinal cord was, 
was no, my, my, my nerves are no longer sending signals. So, uh, I lost the ability to, to move anything, uh, from my neck down. And, and, um, I can remember we got so excited during therapy. I was able to move my thumb, you know, just like that. That was it. And, 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 and the doctors were just giddy about that. Um, and of course I'm frustrated, you know, Jody's trying her best to encourage me and I'm laying in bed going, what, what kind of life is this? Like I've survived the transplant, big whoop, like, like, what am I going to do for a living? How am I going to support my family? Am I going to be this, you know, this invalid the rest of my life? Uh, you know, just put me, put me in a home and go live life, uh, without me. And it was very, very discouraging. Um, did you, did you know, did you, did it sink in that this was a possibility before you started? Um, no, uh, I, I always felt like once the infection was, was gone, like I would immediately just be able to, and even it had the nerves all been firing immediately afterwards, the muscle atrophy would have kept me from, from, you know, from immediately doing stuff. But J Jody and I, we, we just believed that I would walk out of the hospital. Um, and, uh, as the, the days we were at, at the NIH that second time for about five months. And, and during that, towards the end of that journey, it began to sink in. That's not going to happen. I, I'm going to have to, you know, this is going to be a long road and I may not get any better. And so and that's incredibly depressing. Yeah, I was going to say, so that really impacts you both your, your physical body, but also your spirit and your emotions and, um, you know, talk to us because there's a lot of people that out there listening that maybe haven't gone through exactly what you mm -hmm. went through, but have gone through something, um, either, uh, uh, metaphorically like what you've been through, um, or something else. So talk to us a little bit about the emotional aspects of what you were going through. Um, it, some of the darkest times, uh, that I've ever experienced, um, the, you know, the, every now and then they would have a, uh, you know, a psychiatrist come in and I've, I've shared this story before and Scott, you may have even heard me say it, you know, but, but, you know, they come in and they ask you these questions because they have to like, have you ever thought about harming yourself? Have you ever thought about, about taking your own life? And I, you know, I, I would kind of chuckle internally because I'm like, heck yeah, I've thought about that, but I can't, by the way, <laughs> like if I were going to do that, someone would have to help me. I, I can't, I can't move anywhere. Like what, what, what would I do? Um, and, uh, and that's even depressing because you're, you, you know, you, you can't help yourself. You can't, I, there, there's nothing that you can do. And so, um, you know, you're, you drain yourself, you drain the people that are around you. I mean, I, 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 I drug Jody down. I'm, I'm, I know I did, um, uh, you know, and, and, and would just spend so much time just, just frustrated. I, I don't think I ever, J Jody felt like maybe I got mad at God and I think God can certainly handle me being mad at him. I don't know that I was mad at God. My conversation with God was, Hey, why in the world would you save me just for this? Why, why would you save my life just for this type of existence? And it was, it was in that moment that, um, God reminded me of a, of a passage of scripture that, um, I had, come across, you know, years before, um, and in Romans chapter five, where, where Paul says, we rejoice in our sufferings because our sufferings produce endurance, endurance, character, and a character hope. And, um, and so really what, what that meant to me was without any, without any suffering, there is no hope. And, um, and so I, I wish I could tell you that all of that sunk in immediately. It did not uh, it would it would be another, you know, uh, five or six months before, you know, that really even kind of began to to settle in. But um, but this idea that, OK, I, I don't know what the purpose is behind this, but there is something. And um, and gosh, it, it just I'm going to to try everything I can to battle through that. And there were days when I didn't want to. There were probably weeks where I didn't want to. Um uh, but I, I didn't have any other option. I was here. And so I, I had to figure out a way 
uh, to do that. And I had a lot of support around me that was helping me try to figure that out as well. So you've, I mean, you're lying in bed and you can literally only move your thumb. So your thumb was the first thing that, that began moving again. Um, I know that, you know, now you can ride your wheelchair up on the stage. I know that yeah. you put a little riser thing on there so you can, yeah. you know, ride your, and, and that your hands move. You can turn mm -hmm. the pages of the Bible. You, I see you mm -hmm. walk on Facebook. So yeah. you know, things are slowly coming back. Um, sort of what was the physical journey like from going from a thumb moving to where now you're mm -hmm. much more high functioning than you were at that time? Oh, absolutely. Um, so when I first came back from uh, my first physical therapy inpatient was at UAB in Birmingham. And I really actually regressed. And the reason that I regressed is I still had a cyst uh, on my C3, C4 vertebrae very high up here that was putting pressure on my nerves. And, um, and so that they sent me home with this fancy chair going, we, this is your, going to be your existence. And we think you'll be able to drive your chair, but we don't probably don't think anything else will happen after that. Um, I was able to have another operation, um, at Vanderbilt. They were, were able to, to remove the cyst. It was praise God. It wasn't infection. It was just cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, they were able to remove the cyst and drain it. And that was when I started to see the the progress really come. Uh, did another inpatient rehab at Vanderbilt and was and and became able to just kind of move my arms a lot more. Um, you know, every day I had caregivers that that would work my joints and move my hands and and move my arms and 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 slowly but surely I was able to 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 do a little bit more. And um, I was reading a post for that Jody posted the other day. She was so excited because I this was she was I was reading a former post because I fed myself a Chick fil A um, uh, French fry. Uh, you know, I was able to reach down, grab the fry, and get it to my mouth. Um, little things like, Hey, I can scratch my nose now. Like th those were, those were huge progress. Um, I know and, I remember uh, hearing you speak and saying that it was so frustrating to lay in bed and itch and not be able to scratch and know that, and know that like my wife is in the bed next to me and, and I can hear her breathing. She's asleep and, and my nose is killing me and, and I can't scratch it or I'm hot and my arms are under the covers and I need her to put my arms out from under the covers. And I would have to wake her up to do that. And, and, you know, you lay there until you just can't take it anymore. Um, but yeah, we did that. Um, I would be transported the, the way they would move me say from the bed to my chair, uh, was with what's called a Hoyer lift. They put a sling underneath me and lift me up and move me. And, uh, I remember the first time that I was able to, to swing my legs in the Hoyer lift. And we were just so pumped because, Hey, I controlled that on my own. And, um, and, and, and so you begin to see more and more and more. And I, I would go to outpatient therapy here at town at, at, at star in union city here. And, um, I called it toddler training early on because anything that a toddler had to learn to do, I had to learn to do. So like rolling over, um, uh, crawling, uh, you know, they, they would do all of that with me early on. Um, and, uh, it's such a blessing now to be able to, to go in. I, I, I go into star now and I, I, I lay down on this mat before I get started and I do exercises on the mat to limber up before they even start working on me. That were things that we would spend an entire hour working on me doing when I first got started. And so, um, it's just continuing, continuing, continuing. I was talking to Dana Fazell today. I, I went to therapy this morning and, and, and she was talking about how, Hey, we're not seeing any plateaus. We're seeing you continue to improve the things that you're doing now, even last week were hard for you to do. And, and, and so, um, we're, we're just kind of continuing to see that she's convinced that one day, you know, I'll, I am walking short distances without uh, assistance, but I, I look a little bit like a newborn baby calf, you know, when you're just trying to trying to get your feet up under you. And it's really scary. And there's a lot of mental stuff, not just physical stuff that you go through, but uh, seeing some amazing progress. I'm so thankful. Now, what was going on with your church while you're going through all this? Yeah. So um, I wanted to get back and and and, you know, you could talk to some of my elders uh, as soon as I got back, you know, from from the last surgery and I know I'm going to be home and I'm home for good. 
uh, like I was like, okay, you know, let's, let's get me back preaching. And, uh, and, and I can remember, you know, some of those, some of those guys going, Hey, well, let's, let's just take this step by step and, uh, let's get you to, to point a before we, you know, go any farther. And so they, they knew that I was going to have to preach from my chair. So that was where we started researching the lifts and maybe build a ramp. And we needed to, you know, make sure the stage was going to be strong enough for me to do that. And uh, it was 2022, January of 2022 that I I delivered. We didn't even tell anybody. Uh, I just did. I just did a brief little sermonette, if you will, uh, on that day uh, from the floor. I didn't even get on the stage. Uh, and then the first Sunday in February of 2022, I preached my first sermon back. And uh, the goal was to ease in. Garrett Quinn had been, he's the the family pastor here. He had been preaching in my stead. And uh, uh, so I did, the, the goal was for me to preach once in February, twice in March, and three times in April. And uh, I ended up going a little faster than that. Um, but that some of that was uh, accidental. Some of that was me just kind of pushing a little bit because I'm, I'm a little bit stubborn. Um, and uh, and so uh, we we just kind of hit the ground running and slowly but surely worked my way back into the life of my family and the life of the. I mean, I hadn't parented for a year, you know, uh, and hadn't been really on church staff in a year and a half. And um, and so I show back up and having to work a little bit, I just work my way back into the systems uh, that were already here. And, uh, man, my, our staff here at the church was so gracious to me and our elders and the, the, the congregation was so gracious to me and just welcomed me back. And, um, and then I was still reliant on other people. Um, so like, you know, I, if I'm going to go anywhere or somebody has to come pick me up and, um, even once I got to where I could, get in and out of the chair on my own and, you know, get in and out of the shower on my own and those sorts of things. I still, I still needed somebody to drive me. And it was, um, gosh, it was uh, over the summer in 2023, uh, where I, I thought maybe I have enough ability in my legs to drive again. And Jody picked me up one day here at the church parking lot. And I said, why, why don't I just, I mean, we're in the church parking lot here. I could, you know, it, worst case scenario, we, we, we ride out in the field and I have to turn the ignition off, you know? Um, and all of a sudden I'm able to drive. And so I went through the process and got my license back again. And now I'm able to drive myself wherever I want to go. And, um, and uh, man, it was just, that was a freeing moment because now all of a sudden I can, I can come to the office and work. I don't have to work from from my living room because for me to come into the office, man, I needed somebody to come pick me up and bring me in. And um, and so that's how I've kind of worked my way back in. And so, uh, it, man, it's been such a blessing over the last six, seven months just to be able to go where I want to go. You know, I knew I had made it when I ma- went to the Sonic. Uh, when I went to Sonic the first time. I knew like, okay, I, I can I can get in and out of anywhere if I can get in and out of Sonic. Oh, yeah, with that knocking the, that knocking the uh, sign over. That's right. That's right. We're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, I'm going to talk to you about um, how you've been communicating uh, what you've been through and how God is using that. Sure, absolutely. With nine branches in West Tennessee and nationwide ATM and branch access, you can take Leaders Credit Union with you wherever you go. From checking accounts, credit cards, home loans, and their state-of-the-art mobile app, Banking with Leaders can help you move forward. Learn more and see how you can qualify for membership at LeadersCU.com. Leaders is insured by NCUA. Thank you, Zach. I hope you all are enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is Jeremy Powell. So, Jeremy, uh, we left off here in your story. Um, Tell us a little bit about where you are now. I know I read your blog and I read your Facebook posts and talk to us a little bit about how God is kind of using what you've been through um, and where you are now. Well, Jody created a uh, a Facebook group, you know, when I first went and um, 
uh, and she would post these updates on a regular basis. Uh, and that's been really helpful for me to go back and read through some of those because, again, there there are things that I don't remember. Uh, you know, praise God, you know. I mean, I, I coded twice; they had to bring me back a couple times, you know. Um, but I do remember quite a bit. And 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 Scott, I know you and others. I mean, there were thousands of folks that uh, you know from all over the world that that were following my story and praying for me. And I'm so blessed to have been a, you know, to to have had such a support group. Um, but a lot of them didn't know kind of, kind of maybe from my perspective, um, they, they heard from Jody, my mom had made some posts cause she had stayed with me some. Um, and so I thought, what well, what would it look like for me just, and, and really I had no real intention of, of people reading it. Um, it was, it was more of just, Hey, I, I need to go back and think through what I was thinking and think through what I was feeling and, and, and write down what I remember. And so, um, and so that's what I started doing back, I guess, in November or so November, December. Um, I've, I've owned, you know, that, that domain name, jeremypowell.com for forever. And, and so I was like, well, I'll just, I'll just put some stuff together and start writing and uh, and so I've done that. I, I, I kind of went back to the very beginning and started telling the story uh, uh, just like I've shared it with you guys, only uh, quite a bit more detail, I think. And and uh, and trying just to kind of bring people along with me and 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 hopefully letting them feel the things that I felt and sharing some scripture along the way and hopefully encouraging folks that are going through similar situations Um uh, or, or, or situations that, you know, where they don't feel like there's any hope or they don't feel like there's any light at the end of the tunnel or way out. Um, I, I, I want just to let them know that, Hey, you know, even in the middle of, 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 of suffering, uh, God is good. And, and, and even if I never walk again, and even if I'm never able to, to feed myself again, God is still good. And, and there is hope that comes because of the suffering that you're going through. Um, and, uh, and so that's been, it's been therapeutic for me. That, that, that was really the reason I did it. I just wanted, I wanted to be able to kind of work through some of those things and be honest with anybody that was reading, you know, there, there were times when I was going through this where I, man, I was not very, a very godly person. I, I was not very pastoral. There were times where, uh, I was just flat out mean to people uh, especially people that I cared about the most, you know, um, and I'm not proud of that, but I, I wanted to be real with folks. I wanted to, to not paint some picture of me as some saintly, you know, pastor that, that never lost sight of, of Jesus and all of that. Now, certainly uh, on this side of it, I can tell you, God was with me the whole time and I'm so thankful that he was, but, but there were times where I I was just you know frustrated and angry and 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 all of those things and I wanted to be sure to to share all of that in the process. So well, because people think ministers are perfect. And oh so, no, no, uh, we're just like we're just like, no, not at all. And we only work one day a week. So there you go. <laughs> exactly, it's easy. You had a lot of a lot of free time. That's right. <laughs> so is there a book in your future? I don't know. Uh, maybe I, I'm not a writer. Jody's the writer. We'll let her write the book. I, I'm I get I'm much better with my with my voice than I am. Well, so uh, how do you, how do you write your blogs and everything? Do you your are your fingers typing? Oh yeah, no, I, I can absolutely everything works just fine. I um I, I go back and I've I've taken all of Jody's posts. Uh, and I put them in a chronological kind of order for me. And so I kind of go back and see the things that she's writing down. And, and as that happens, that spawns some memories. Um, and so I, you know, what I'll do then is I'll just kind of say, Hey, I want to talk about these five things in this post. And like I said, uh, on a Sunday, a couple of weeks ago, my goal is to write a thousand words every time I sit down to write, that's it. Uh, and, uh, and that's not that many, that's not that hard. Um, and so I just, I want to give people just bite-sized chunks of the story, um, and hopefully make them want to come back and, and read the next little bit. So, um, uh, I don't know that you're, you're the, you're the book writer. I'm, I'm not the, I'm not the book writer. We'll see if something comes along from that. You know, what could be really interesting is to alternate chapters. 
have her write a chapter about what you went through during that time and then have you write a chapter of what you remember and what you went through and then sort of see, you know, because, you know, those of us that are married know, you know, that that what you're going through struggles, you often interpret things completely different, you know, mm-hmm. and so it could be interesting, you know, yeah, to, I, to do that. No, she definitely has a story to tell and, I, I am so, so, so thankful for her in this entire process. Just even going back and reading the things that she wrote, the the way that she prayed for me and the way that she cared for me. And um uh man, she was she was amazing through it all. And I know it wasn't easy for her. I didn't got, make it easy for her a lot of it. Uh, we've also got a shout out to both your girls who uh folks can see working at our ticket counter from time to time. Yeah, that, um, that's right. They are customer service superstars, both of them. So <laughs> kudos, kudos for providing uh, staff for Discovery Park. Um, I could thank you so much for hiring them. They love working there. Um, uh, it's fun to, to, to listen to some of the stories they get to share and the experiences they get to have. It's definitely a great experience for them. So um, if, if folks are listening and they're curious and they want to find out more, um, tell us where can they, uh, find out more about you and your journey and also where can they, uh, watch, uh, Crosswind, um, on YouTube? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, um, uh, I am, uh, my, my journey is being documented, um, on, uh, at jeremypowell.com and, uh, but I also share all of those posts through, Facebook. So you can find me on all the socials, Facebook and Instagram. Um, and, uh, and I share all those there, the praying for Jeremy page. I share the post there as well. And then if you want to see us at Crosswind Church, we're at crosswindchurch.net. Uh, we have a YouTube channel, uh, and you can also check us out on our Facebook page as well. We stream live every Sunday at 930. We have services at 930, 11. We stream live at 930. Uh, every Sunday. And, you know, for somebody who's uh, uh, looking for either a church home in person or Mm -hmm. digitally, I know Mm -hmm. that my wife and I, sometimes we skip and we watch it. We watch (laughs) it from our living room. You know, COVID, you know, sort of changed everybody's perspective. And so, um, you know, we hear you oftentimes on Sunday mornings um, from YouTube on our TV. Mm -hmm. Um, So I can honestly say, you know, for somebody who, you know, is um, hasn't been going to church or, you know, thinks it's boring, they should uh, uh, listen to you. My wife always says, you know, every Sunday, Jeremy is like a Ted talk, you mm, know, I and, and I have short attention span. And so you keep me, at- you keep my attention from beginning to end. So, you know, I highly recommend folks, you know, popping in and listening, uh, to Jeremy and his, his messages there really, really will, uh, make your life better. Well, I appreciate that. And there's an archive there as well. So you can go check out past stuff as well. Thank you for joining us today. Man, thank you so much, Scott, for having me. And thank you to all you listeners who joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com.